So welcome to my channel. Living in Seattle is a really focused channel for people who are planning on relocating to the area. My name is Emily Cressy. I'm a real estate agent and I have lived in this area pretty much all my life except when I left to go to college, started investing, got married and brought my husband back here. So uh, we're here, we're settled in the North Seattle area and I love showing people around and getting them used to the idea of what the Seattle market looks like educating them and that's exactly what this channel is for so make sure if you haven't already subscribe so you can see our upcoming videos and take a look at our library i have a lot of videos from uh, maps where we go through what part of town you want to be living in to actually getting out in the car and driving you around so you can see what your commute like might look like what your neighborhoods might look like all that kind of thing so please join us if you have any questions i avidly devour those. I'm like a words of affirmation person. So any compliments you give me make me feel so good. If you don't have a compliment, if you don't like the area, if you don't agree with my opinion, that is fine too. I am a freedom of thought person. If, uh, you're not going to get censored here. So make sure that you, whatever you think, even if you hate something, uh, like, oh, my friend got killed over on that corner. You can put that in the comments too. And I'm sure that the different viewers would appreciate your um, feedback on any neighborhoods that you have personal experience with. So in this particular video, we're going to be talking about living in Seattle versus Bellevue. And uh, this has been something that in general, a lot of people are curious about because we kind of have Seattle has been the big pin on the map for a long time. Every, you know, every state or area has its iconic areas, right? Chicago, New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Seattle is kind of that big name city in uh, Washington state. However, the greater Seattle area expands quite a bit beyond the, the city limits of Seattle itself. And so now with Seattle and Bellevue, we really have almost a twin city type of thing going on. Uh, Seattle has the bigger downtown, more you know big tall buildings. It has the sports stadiums and the theaters and that type of thing. But Bellevue has its own downtown with skyscrapers. There aren't as many as there are in Seattle, but it does have a downtown. And I would promote the idea that it's perhaps growing faster or growing in a better direction than Seattle. So we'll go into a few minutes and into a few reasons of why that might be. So Seattle and Bellevue are right across the lake from each other. And we have two bridges that actually serve as a go-between. So on the south end of Seattle, we have the I-90 bridge. This is an interstate bridge that actually is part of a interstate highway that goes all the way east to the east coast. And that one's free to go across. We also have the 520 floating bridge, which is part of a state highway, and they've recently imposed a toll. So anytime you cross that bridge, you're gonna be paying a toll, whether it's five bucks or something else that they can adjust the rate depending on how crowded it is, what time of day, that type of thing. Um, buses and uh, soon the light rail will also be going across there as well to help get people back and forth across the lake. So those two bridges service us. And then we also have uh, the freeways. So I-5 is the international freeway going from the border in Canada to the border in Mexico, south through Washington, Oregon, and California. And so that's the main drag for commuting purposes uh, into Seattle. However, Bellevue has its own kind of loop freeway, which you've seen in other cities, I'm sure. And it starts at the top end of Lake Washington, and it goes down southeast around to the south end of Lake Washington and uh, comes out right by SeaTac Airport. So if you're just driving north and south along the Bellevue side, that's the freeway that you're gonna use. Uh, and if you live at the bottom or the top of the lake, you can go up in either direction. Now, this 405 loop has um, just actually rebuilt in the last couple years, and they've added several lanes to the highway. But what we have going on there is uh, toll lanes. So about three of the lanes are free and you can always use them at any time. And then two of the lanes are toll lanes where they charge you again a varying fee. And the more crowded the main freeway is, the slower traffic is, there's an accident up ahead, then the more they crank up the fee to use these paid lanes because they want to make sure that those keep moving so that if you need to get to work or an appointment or you're having a medical emergency, that the road is still passable. And um, 
Otherwise, it would be flooded with, well, you know, if it's going to take me an hour because I'm stuck in traffic, I can pay a dollar to go on to the free lanes. That's a no-brainer. But if it's going to take me an hour and I'm stuck in traffic and then I'm charged $10 to go into the toll lanes, maybe not everybody wants to pay that much. Um, it's also an incentive to get people shunted onto public transportation, which is a really big deal around here. So on the Seattle side, they've allowed for traffic uh, with uh, HOV lanes, which is high occupancy vehicle lanes. And they also have something called the express lanes, which are reversible. So there's kind of two or three lanes going from Northgate Mall, about 110th uh, Street Northeast, north of Seattle, down into downtown Seattle, and they end just south of downtown. So these lanes really only help you if you're coming from the north end, uh, which has primarily been more of our residential area. And then South Seattle had a lot more of the airport stuff. They've got Boeing and SeaTac and manufacturing. So uh, not as many people have been living South for as long. These express lanes actually, um, they're open and they have little gates that come down like this. And uh, they have little guys that drive in trucks. And so essentially they're open in the morning when everyone is driving into the city, they're open to the South. And then the little arms come down and the guys in trucks drive through to make sure that everybody has cleared out. And then they open the lanes going in the other direction. And so in the afternoon when everyone's leaving the city, then we have additional lanes, additional capacity bringing us um, to the north. So these are some of the ways that they have tried to handle traffic. Traffic is still really difficult for a lot of people um, commuting downtown on a regular basis. Things you can do are to go off hours, like stagger your commute so you're not going during the peak of rush hour, uh, driving with a buddy or a partner, maybe taking a van pool so that you can take advantage of those high occupancy vehicle lanes. Um, and then also, like I said, they really want people to go on public transportation. So we do have a lot of buses and a lot of um, light rail coming online. Uh, right now, the light rail only goes as far north as uh, Northgate, but they're about to open the next leg of this, which uh, the light rail train will go from Northgate up to uh, Linwood with several stops along the way. So it's really meant to be a commuter train. It's not the fastest because they do make a lot of stops, but the nice thing is it's completely hands-free. So if you want to read a book, listen to a podcast, get out your laptop and start working, you can at least do something other than road rage uh, during that that commute time. We have had troubles with the light rail <laughs> uh, because of people not paying to ride it, um, people peeing in it, uh, those types of things. So, and it's brand new. So that's unfortunate, but hopefully as, uh, you know, more people are coming back to work and not working from home, more paid paying commuters are coming back and forth, then uh, we'll see that shape up into something that's fairly nice. Right now, the light rail does take you through um, downtown Seattle, University of Washington, uh, and all the way down south to the SeaTac Airport. So it's pretty convenient, especially for getting to the airport for tourists, for business travel, and that type of thing. It should be coming, like I said, online, and I expect that it will have a, a significant amount of ridership going forward for daily commuters. So this has really been a quick dive into uh, the Seattle versus Bellevue traffic issue. Like many things in Bellevue, you can just expect to pay more. So you have those toll lanes, you have your toll bridge, you have a better, better, newer highway. And this is, this is actually a great metaphor <laughs> because a lot of things in Bellevue are more expensive. The next topic that I wanna touch on is housing prices. So because a lot of people do prefer to live on the east side. And east side is the east side of Lake Washington. That's our local jargon. So Seattle is on the west side. It's along Puget Sound. It has saltwater access. We're right on the ocean there. And um, Seattle's kind of bordered by Puget Sound on one side on the west and Lake Washington on the east. So that's one of the reasons that traffic is bad, actually, is because everybody is really shunted north and south along the I-5 corridor and there's not a lot of uh, like places to build. Like Houston, you could live in a big circle around it. We have water, water everywhere. We have mountains. And um, so we're a lot more restricted. The whole city of Seattle is fairly dense population-wise. It's going to be hard to find something with a big, huge yard, for example. 
uh, unless it's very expensive. So anyway, traffic is an issue and then housing prices are an issue. And because Bellevue has gotten very popular, we have uh, that question of what can you actually afford? Most people like the idea of living in Bellevue. It has great schools. Uh, well, it has a lot of pros. <laughs> we'll go into them. We'll see which ones are right for you. But one of the biggest cons, probably the biggest con is the housing prices. Uh, last year, we saw a median housing price of 1.4 million in that area, whereas on the Seattle side, it was closer to seven, eight, nine hundred thousand to buy a basically equivalent median type of home. You will be paying a premium to live there, and whether that's worth it to you, if you even want to live there, is is one of the questions that this video is helping you evaluate. I can't definitely say for sure. You know, at the end, this is city is best, but. You, if you read between the lines and kind of see what's most important to you, you can see if you want to pay the premium to live in Bellevue or if you like the idea of sticking to the Seattle side. It may just depend on where you want to go to work, right? Whether, where your family lives or something else. So there are other, other features to consider. Uh, so I mentioned schools. Schools are pretty consistently great in the Bellevue side as far as public schools go. Now, um, I went to both public and private school. My kids have gone a little bit to public, a little bit of homeschooling. Uh, we didn't like the direction that public school was going for my son who had some issues there. So we actually took him out and I homeschooled him for until seventh grade. So we did quite a bit of that, which was a wonderful experience. And I'm so glad to have had the time together with him and my daughter. My daughter is just, you know, everything works out for her. So she had a great time. She was great in all her situations, but she never actually experienced um, public school herself. You know, depending on how you feel about public school, depending on how you feel about politics, obviously there have been a lot of changes in public schools, but as these things go, test grades and, and the things that are ranking school districts, the Bellevue schools tend to get top marks. The Seattle schools are a little bit more hit and miss. So you'll want to look at a great website like uh, greatschools.org is a, a one that I often recommend to people. I often use it on my videos and you can actually go to the site, type in a city, look at the map of the area that you're thinking of living in and it'll show you like pins on the map, what the different um, rankings are of the schools nearby. And you might have an excellent high school, but weaker elementary schools. So you can think about um, the ages of your kids and which ones are most important to you. So as you see in Bellevue, pretty uniformly great schools. If you're not a public schools person, there are also private school options there. And Bellevue has a lot of high end, high net worth, very smart people working um, in very intense jobs. So we got Microsoft is over there, which is one of the big employers. Um, obviously, you know, Bill Gates founded that. Bill Gates, who went to my high school, but now has become a little bit more of a hot potato. So <laughs> um, I don't know if I want to claim him or not. This whole area has a, sort of a cachet. We have Medina, which is one of the most expensive neighborhoods. Clyde Hill with views of Lake Washington. Yarrow Point, Hunts Point. These are little um, very expensive luxury home enclaves in uh, right along Lake Washington and also very close to downtown Bellevue. So uh, it's a it's a very pricey area. There are more affordable options, but they're gonna tend to be smaller homes, older homes, and condominiums. There are townhouses too, which are kind of a nice middle ground. So depending on who you wanna spend time with, if you like the idea of rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous, you will find big names and fancy people down there in Medina and Bellevue. However, there's a little bit more of a lifestyle to keep up with. I find that people tend to be a little bit more fashion conscious, appearance conscious, uh, just a little bit more Rodeo Drive over there on that side of the lake um, as a gross generalization. <laughs> and Seattle side is a little bit more of a an REI. I just got back running and now I need to take a shower type of vibe. So depending on... <laughs> Who you vibe with more, maybe that's like, oh, I'm there or I'm there. Either way, you can find lovely people everywhere. But I will say Seattle tends to be a little bit more casual, a little bit more liberal, a little bit more gender fluid, 
um, a little bit more pink hair, you know, that type of vibe. And I would say Bellevue just tends to be a little bit more buttoned up leather shoes, coach handbag, you know, Burberry, if I had to brand, which I think I am. This is kind of like Apple guy versus Mac guy or something. Seattle versus Bellevue. <laughs> so one thing that we haven't talked about much is the idea of waterfront property. So in Bellevue, we actually have quite a bit of waterfront property along Lake Washington. And we have Bellevue and then we have north of Bellevue, which is Kirkland uh, and Kenmore. We're going to have great access to Lake Washington. South of Bellevue, it gets a little bit harder because the 405 freeway runs pretty close to the lake at that point. However, east of Lake Washington and east of Bellevue is another lake called Lake Sammamish, which is also a great place to have waterfront property. It just um, it creates another barrier. So if you're on the east side of Lake Sammamish, you'd have to drive around that lake as well as getting around Lake Washington to get into the city of Seattle. And why might you want to go to Seattle if you lived in Bellevue? There are a couple of resources over there. Um, really, it's a huge center for the arts and sports. A lot of our big entertainment things are there. Uh, we have the Seattle Seahawks. We have the Kraken hockey team. We have uh, the professional soccer team, the Seattle Sounders. We have the Mariners professional baseball team. So we have a lot of really nice sports. We also have the Seattle Opera. We have the Puget Sound Ballet. Um, no, it's no, the Northwest Ballet. We have a lot of shows and things like that. So you can tell I haven't got out very much lately. But, but we have the Fifth Avenue Theater with Broadway shows. You know, we have ha Hamilton, The Lion King, a lot of great theater options, symphonies, orchestras, operas. A lot of those types of things are in Seattle. So you might find that in order to access that, you're coming into Seattle. There are a few things like there's the Maidenbauer Conference Center in Bellevue where they've had special events. My sister went to a wedding show there before she got married. Um, and in Bellevue, what else? Oh, they have a big, huge park called Marymore Park. So they have a big, huge park called Marymore Park in Bellevue which is a huge acreage. It's a wonderful place to go out and spend time. And they've actually had shows there too. Like when Cirque du Soleil came to town, they set up in Marymore Park with their circus tents and things like that. So they do have um, outdoor concerts and other events in Bellevue uh, for sure. And the really cool thing about our Lake Washington and Puget Sound um, access is that there's actually a connection. There is a canal where you can boat back and forth through these two big bodies of water. And it is a little bit complicated. They actually have what's called a locks and it's kind of like a water elevator. It helps the boats. Um, they The boats come from the lower body of water up into this kind of retaining wall. Then they have a retaining wall on the other side that closes like a dam. And then they let the water in from the higher side. So this little thing with the boats fills up the water level and then they can boat out the other side. It's called the Ballard Locks. And then um, you're going through the Ship Canal to get into Lake Washington. The, the whole Washington state has a lot of hydroelectric power. We have rivers and dams all over the place. So this has become like a big environmental controversy. Like we need the dams for electricity. We do have cheap power here. But at the same time, you know, it's hurting the salmon population because the salmon go into the ocean and then they try to go up into the lakes and the freshwater streams where they were born or where they hatched. And that's where they go to lay their eggs and die. And so they need to be able to make it back up there to complete the salmon life cycle. So we don't run out of salmon, which is another thing you should try uh, eating salmon. That is <laughs> if you come to the area, we have a lot of wonderful local fresh seafood and um, there's some great restaurants I can recommend. Just let me know what you're in the mood for. And um, I, I'm making a list actually of places that I think people will like. So let me know if you'd, be, if you'd need a copy of that. But here's the big, here's the rub. So we've all been kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other, some pros and cons between Seattle and Bellevue, but I haven't really dropped the bomb on you yet. Um, and the bomb definitely applies to Seattle and some of the outlying communities, but um, as you hear about it and you maybe get concerned about it, I would just like to say that um, it's mostly pertaining to the city of Seattle itself. We have this city of Seattle population 700,000. 
greater Seattle area population between three and 4,000. I'm sorry, between three and 4 million. So we have a lot of places to live that we call Seattle or the Seattle area that are not actually the city of Seattle. Uh, the city of Seattle is where these problems exist that I'm going to tell you about. And largely that's because of Seattle City Council policy. We've had people on the Seattle City Council who are outright socialists, I think they say, and they're Policies have been tried and proven um, problematic for the city and the business community there. So uh, I think a lot of those seats are opening up. Those folks are not all running for re-election. A lot of damage has been done and the jury is still out on uh, what exactly the future holds for the city of Seattle itself. Okay, so here are the bombs. We have a pretty strong homelessness, drug, and mental health population issue in Seattle right now. And so you will probably notice this when you first land the plane in Seattle and are driving up the freeway I-5, you will start to notice graffiti and vandalism, especially like under the freeway itself along the road. You'll see people sleeping in tents and camps under the freeway and along the road. And it really gives off a third world vibe. And that's just from the freeway itself. When you get into the city of Seattle, I've uh, I've been there like with my mom for her birthday, taking pictures and going to Pike Place and stuff like that. And I've had tourists come up to me and say like, whoa, you know, we got here at night and we didn't know if we were like in a safe area or not. Um, and there are definitely areas like Pioneer Square, which is the historic kind of south of downtown, the south end of the tall buildings there. Uh, Pioneer Square has a totem pole. Anyway, it has kind of a nice open park-like setting, but there are park benches and that open space tends to bring people who want to linger. So it's interesting to see that that area continues to attract uh, indigent people. And, you know, I, I really don't want this to come across like I'm criticizing the alcoholic people. Like I know that everyone has their own issues. It's more of a city management issue. Like are the policies that we're putting in place helping these people because I don't think their ideal life is living on the street and freezing to death and dying in the middle of the night. Uh, I've been driving in my car through that area and I've had people actually like knock on the door or the window while I was uh, at a stoplight. I've had them like weaving through traffic with their little signs, soliciting handouts. I've had, um, I, well, I did not have a I don't know how to say this delicately. I have seen people running around without their pants on. That was only once. Um, and there have been a few shootings in downtown Seattle. Now, I don't want to scare people. This is not like Metro Chicago or anything like that. But there are certain areas that are known as like, oh, that's a drug area. Like you shouldn't walk on Third Avenue by the Benaroya Concert Hall, which is a beautiful building. But what the point was, though, is we have this nice like fancy concert hall, opera center, and then right outside is this, you know, place where 20 to 30 people gather, like passing little packages back and forth. We were there, like I said, with my mom taking pictures for her birthday at Pike Place. And so we came around the corner to her building. She's also a lawyer and works um, right near there on Third Avenue. That was like the fastest route to go from Pike Place Market to Third. Uh, we turned the corner on Third and it was just like, oh, so my life, the the things slowed down, like air drained, my vision focused. And I was just like, mom, I can't even hear what you're saying. I'm just blocking you out. I was like looking around, feeling scandalized, feeling afraid, clutching my purse, like just trying to walk through this little group. It was only half a block or so, but it just made me feel very uncomfortable. And then apparently everybody knows already that that's a bad spot. Um, we knew that it was a bad spot, but we just didn't think about it as we were walking. And so uh, <laughs> I don't know why the police don't just like put a guy there and break it up. Maybe people would disperse to a different block, but um, that's kind of what we see in downtown Seattle. Um, and it is worse in Pioneer Square than some of the other areas. It got worse when everybody was working from home because there weren't as many gainfully employed people also sharing the streets, restaurants shut, food trucks shut, like it kind of emptied out and became a ghost town a little bit. And then, you know, the zombies crept in. And that was sort of the vibe. Outside of downtown, the main struggles are just still things like panhandling, 
graffiti, not as many tents, but some mostly concentrated along the freeway. And then uh, some churches will do things like, we want to help the homeless. And so we're going to let them have tents in our parking lot. So there are like tent cities, as they're called. And sometimes these will rotate by on an invitation basis. Sometimes they'll get broken up. But I've gone to show a condo before and it's like the condo looked great in the pictures but right across the street was a tent city where 30 people had set up their tents and they have a little homelessville going on right there my sister lives in shoreline at the north end of seattle a lot of times she would be like driving south through into seattle to go to the lowe's or the home depot or that type of thing and what she noticed was that as you cross into the city of seattle that's when the prostitution starts uh, along Aurora Avenue, Highway 99, which is one of the big main drags. And um, that's where you get the crazy people. She's, um, she's seen prostitution with the people, the ladies, the gals with the very chilly looking apparel, um, walking back and forth, standing, hanging out on, on street for whatever reason. Um, she's seen really crazy stuff going on in the Lowe's parking lot with like, a pimp going around like checking on business that was being done in different people's vehicles. And I don't want to make it sound like every area in Seattle is bad. You know, Ballard had a very controversial, like Ballard was a very fancy, expensive, like hip, uh, hipster type of area with a lot of bars and that kind of a thing. But then they put in this um, homeless, like it was a homeless apartment building, like subsidized income apartment building. And I remember that was very controversial. My sister used to live in Ballard before she lived in Shoreline and she had a, a park nearby with like people RV parking and throwing drug needles around. So you just got to know what you know. I would say wrapping this video up, coming to a conclusion, Bellevue is going to be cleaner and safer in general than Seattle. Uh, Seattle is a beautiful, huge, large city with a lot to offer, a lot of housing, waterfront property, water view property, you know, doctors, law school professors, tech people, all sorts of um, high paying career people also live on that side. And there are wonderful, expensive, high end luxury neighborhoods there. I would say a lot of people buy a home in an area that they like and then figure out a way to safely get back and forth to where they need to go for work and sort of plan their social activities around what works best for them. So this is by no means to disparage Seattle. I grew up, you know, Seattle was a very hippie, like sort of 1960s world fair. A lot of our infrastructure and vibe came from there. There were our bumper shoot outdoor music festival, and it just seemed real chill and real loving and everything like that. And I think it's evolved quite a bit uh, during my life. And I would just, you know, the time I was here as a kid, it had one vibe Then I went off to college and everything. And then I came back and I felt like it had a different vibe. You probably don't care about the old vibe. You're probably focused on the current vibe and what direction that's going. And so I would say pretty definitively, most metrics are gonna put Bellevue, Redmond, the east side of the lake as performing much better. The big challenge there is the housing prices. If you want to live in Bellevue, be prepared to pay up. A lot of people do. They're paying a premium to be on that side. If you can't make it work, uh, people are spreading north and south. So Bothell is a suburb north of Bellevue that's been just growing explosively lately. And Renton is a less expensive um, they have a Boeing plant there. Uh, it's been a little bit more older, not invested in, but now there's a lot of pressure coming down the lake from Bellevue through Newcastle and into Renton to um, make that area nicer. You can also stretch east into Issaquah for some nice newer homes as well. That's an area that's really been growing as well. So I hope this video gives you some great insight into the pros and cons, the issues relating to Seattle and Bellevue, and you can kind of think about what you are willing to put up with and what you're not. Remember, the downsides of Seattle are really pretty closely confined to the city of Seattle itself. So maybe check out some of my other videos on popular Seattle suburbs if you'd like to find another place to live that's gonna be a little more affordable 
and still really nice avoiding a lot of these problems that are coming out of Seattle right now. So thanks so much. This is Emily Cressy. If you need help safely navigating some neighborhoods that you think are going to be a good fit for you, I'm a real estate agent and I would love to show you around, give you some home tours. If you're just here for the weekend, if you're here for the week, if you want to do video tours, I have a lot of different ways of helping people who are looking to relocate to this area and I would love to help you. So please feel comfortable reaching out to my office, giving me a call, sending me an email, or contacting me through my website, homeproassociates.com. Again, my name is Emily. It's so nice to have you here. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or want me to look into some areas that you're considering. And I will see you on the next videos. We're going to show some other videos that are coming up here that I think will be a really great fit for you. So make sure you explore those, go deeper into my channel and let me know what you think on the next one.